television signals, the broadcast signals, did not yet reach cities like Winnemucca, Nevada. <laughs> the stores closed at 5 o'clock. Hardware stores don't keep late hours. And if you don't like gambling in Winnemucca, there's not much to do. So what I did was to load up my car with my cutlery samples. My cutlery samples were these two rolls. They looked like sleeping bags with handles. But they each weighed about 85 pounds because they were full of knives. <laughs> I visited this one pawn shop. This is part of the client base that I was serving. This one pawn shop in Salt Lake City. And nobody from the company had gone in there for, well, 40 years. Because the last person who visited was my grandfather. And he quit going because they didn't buy anything. So I walked in the door. I hadn't taken a step inside the door. I said, I know who you are. I recognize those sample rolls. Your grandfather bought those in here. Back in, I guess it was 38 or so. Where's he been? <laughs> I said he died. Okay. Anyway, so there wasn't anything to do after hours in these out of the way places. So in addition to loading up the car with cutlery samples, I loaded up the car with books, history books. My other grandfather was a sucker for traveling book salesmen. There used to be traveling book salesmen. And they would come to the door, and they, well, for actually, until fairly recently, you could uh, encounter traveling salesmen who would sell encyclopedias. And people put themselves through college summer selling encyclopedias. But they also sold, in the earlier days, they sold all sorts of books, including such things as the complete works of Sir Walter Scott. No one should have the complete works of Sir Walter Scott. No one should read the complete works of Sir Walter Scott. I didn't read all of them. I read some of them. But I mostly read history. And I became fascinated with history. And the kind of history that I read was not history books like by authors like myself. It was the raw stuff of history. There is this historian who these days, if he were still alive, uh, would be accused of massive plagiarism, of outright fraud. His name was Hubert Howe Bancroft. It is for Hubert Howe Bancroft, I don't know if this means anything to any of you, but the Bancroft Library at the University of California Ber at Berkeley is named for Hubert Howe Bancroft. He was the great historian of the West. And he didn't write any of the books that were published under his name. He hired research assistants to compile the books, and that's all they were. They weren't even authored. They were compiled. And these were essentially where somebody took a bunch of diaries, letters, just old stuff, and dumped them between covers. And I found this absolutely fascinating. And I read up on the arcana of the history of the Pacific Northwest, and then the history of the West Coast generally, and the settlement of the West, and all this stuff. And I was reading about the territory that I was driving across. And I was reading it through the accounts of people who had been there 200 years earlier, who were leading wagon trains, who were leading fur trading expeditions. And I found this utterly fascinating. And it was this that convinced me, first of all, that history was really interesting. Uh, turned out I actually didn't like uh, selling cutlery. Uh, I later discovered, at least I sort of convinced myself, that I'm a reasonably good salesman. And after all, you're still sitting here after an hour and a half. And with any kind of luck, you're going to buy my books. <laughs> there. I, did I tell you that there are books on sale afterwards? And the author will be happy to sign them? Anyway, um, so I decided that I wanted to, um, I started thinking about writing history. But I was too, uh, I didn't have enough nerve to just jump in and write history. So I decided to start off by teaching. And it was turned out to be a relatively easy uh, career transition, because I started off teaching in high school, in fact, in a private high school, where I didn't have to get a teaching credential. And so I taught there for a while and decided I liked it. But I thought, well, I think I want to write as well. So I moved from teaching high school to teaching college, where part of the job description is writing. And so it's great. I get to teach, and I get to write. And I get to tell stories to audiences like you. Maybe one more question, because I, you've been very patient. Yes, ma'am. influence about the poor, and the un, because she was so concerned with that in her later life. Eleanor Roosevelt is a major part of my story. I initially pitched my book to my publisher. When I, I wrote a book on Andrew Jackson. And then for the next project, I said, here's what I want to do. I want to write a joint biographer, uh, a biography of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, because they were the, the form, they remain the foremost political couple in American history. Now, perhaps the Clintons will become that 
if Hillary should get the nomination, for example, then, then everybody will have to acknowledge the Clintons become the number one political power couple in American history. But until now, it's Franklin and Eleanor. And I wanted to do this partly because Eleanor was interesting in her own right, partly because you cannot understand Franklin without trying to figure out Eleanor. Now, partly for the personal reasons that I've described, but also because they were this political tag team during the 1930s. Eleanor was consistently to the left of Franklin. She was more liberal than Franklin. She was more sensitive to the needs and the concerns of the poor, of racial minorities. And she was able to reach out to groups like that in a way that Franklin either couldn't or wouldn't. And with Franklin, it's hard to tell. Now, part of the reason that Franklin couldn't was that when Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1932, it was the first time a Democrat had been elected since Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's election was a historical accident. It was because the Republicans split. From 1860 until 1932, this was the Republican era in national politics and especially in presidential politics. Roosevelt finally became president in 1932, a Democrat became president in 1932, by putting together a very unstable coalition, a coalition consisting of urban political machines from the big cities, uh, including various ethnic groups in the big cities, and Southern Democrats, very conservative Southern Democrats, downright racist Southern Democrats. And Roosevelt knew that he couldn't get anywhere on any subject without cultivating those Southerners, particularly Southern senators who had been in the Senate forever and as a result of the seniority rules in the Senate, chaired all the important committees in the Senate. And if Roosevelt tried to do anything, for example, toward dismantling the segregationist Jim Crow system, he would immediately alienate all of the people he needed on those Southern on those southern-headed committees, and nothing would get through Congress. So Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, would send Eleanor out. He would send Eleanor out to talk to the NAACP. He would send Eleanor out to talk to various poor groups, minority groups in the South and around the country, and let Eleanor say, and partly because Eleanor would say it of her own volition, but also because it worked well for Franklin, that the president would like to do what you want him to do. The president would like to support what you're advocating, but there are all those reactionaries in the Senate that he has to deal with, and he simply can't. Now, I have to try to figure out to what extent Eleanor is a free agent in this, to what extent she is Franklin's lieutenant. Partly this rests on my perception of the politics of the two. I actually think I have a pretty good handle on the, Eleanor's politics, on Franklin's politics. Uh, Eleanor's a little bit easier on her politics because actually she's more reflective in this regard. She wrote two volumes of memoirs and tons of newspaper columns. Franklin wrote none, nothing like that. But the personal aspect is a little bit hard to fathom because after this the big furor within the family over the Lucy Mercer affair, they, they reconcile to a certain extent. As far as I can tell and as far as anybody in the family can tell, they were never intimate again, but they did share children. It's almost like a couple that has been divorced but still has to deal with the fact that they have this family together. But it's more than that. Because after the kids grow up and move out, of course, Eleanor's still around. They still share a house. They don't share a bedroom. Eleanor spends a lot of time gone to the extent that uh, one of the Washington papers wrote a joke headline in about 1935 or 1936. Eleanor Roosevelt spends night at the White House <laughs> because she's always somewhere else. So I have to try to figure out what Eleanor saw in this relationship what she was going to get out of this. Uh, likewise for Franklin. And I mentioned that uh, Franklin did not entirely follow through on his promise never to see Lucy again. 